This is a recording from a Sunday meeting of the BC Humanist Association in Vancouver. Humanism is a progressive worldview that, without supernaturalism, affirms our ability and responsibility to lead meaningful, ethical lives capable of adding to the greater good of humanity. To learn more about humanism and to support our work, visit bchumanist.ca and make sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and be sure to subscribe to the BC Humanist Podcast. The opinions expressed in this podcast do not necessarily reflect those of our staff or board of directors. Okay, now it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker for today, Boris Reitman, Atheism Q&A, The Origins of Stories in the Old Testament. Boris Reitman runs the local Atheism Q&A meetup and has a background in philosophy. In this talk, he will talk about his group and give one of his presentations on the origins of Judaism. Please welcome Boris to our meeting today. Boris. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for coming here. The fact that you're here and you're interested about these issues speaks a lot about you. Many people just accept things as they are. They follow the traditions that they inherited and they do not ask any questions. The fact that you're here means that you're curious about what is the origins of all these things. And you're looking for another way. This is one of the reasons that I started this meetup group in uh, Vancouver called Atheism Q&A. Now, what's a strange name for a meetup group? Q&A. Q&A is usually something that happens at the end of a meeting. But this is a part of my name. Well, that's because I don't exactly want atheists, only atheists, to come to my group. I would like everyone to come to my group. Uh, but the focus has to be a point of view of atheism. And then if they have a question, they can ask me. I'll be happy to answer. And if the question challenging, challenges the atheism view, that's fine. But uh, I thought to put Q&A right in the name. When I started the group, I didn't quite know how to run it, how, how to talk about it, because uh, for me, it's a very simple thing. I don't believe in any kind of supernatural uh, entity, and that's the end of the story. How can I make a meetup group that lasts more than t- one minute or one more than 10 minutes, right? So I thought about it, and I thought to make it interesting for everyone, including myself. And I decided to talk about and investigate myself the history and origins of all these religions. They must have come from somewhere, and they must have had some kind of purpose. What was the purpose? Uh, Was it a good purpose? Was it an evil purpose? Let's find out. So before uh, talking about uh, actual history of religions, I will talk a little bit more about my meetup so you get a better understanding what I'm talking about. This is a list of topics that I did in this theme as part of uh, my meetup. Compare this to other kind of YouTubes maybe you have watched and people just argue endlessly and nothing comes out of it. I have a very intellectual kind of discussion in my groups. So these are the topics. I started with general history of religions, of what uh, was going on before even their people lived in cities, when they lived in tribes. They also had a religion, surprisingly. Then how did religion move into civilization? When people moved in ancient Egypt, they started living in cities. The religion that they have inherited from all those tribal societies got transformed, and now it is, has a new form, but still similar, it still can be related to uh, the tribal period. Then I was uh, thinking, okay, how can I just make it interesting so it's not totally chronological? And I was thinking about some topics that could be interesting to everyone, and I came up with this religion and money and early civilizations. This kind of topic spans across many locales. So I covered several of them. I covered ancient Egypt, ancient Babylon, and India, at least three locales. Continuing with the same theme, I uh, thought, okay, what else is common to all these places? And I thought ancestor worship and treating of what happens after death. Many uh, religions and traditions, they really wonder, what happens when I die? And they have their own mythology associated with it. Do they really believe it, or do they just do it as a tradition? That's not, I'm not sure about that. But it was interesting to investigate what is the mythology in different nations about life after death. And you know, in China, it's still a very active uh, practice. They have this uh, tomb sweeping day, which is a really huge thing, as big as Christmas here. Everyone goes to these uh, cemeteries, and they, uh, they used to burn real money. 
but uh, now they buy fake money with real money and they burn the, burn the famous. <laughs> so, but they, and they also put real food on the graves. But this, this custom is quite ancient. It's not uh, just that they thought of it recently in China. It was all over the place. Yep. Okay. So you see, this way I went through all different kind of topics and slowly I, I uh, returned to the chronological uh, style. I talked about religion in India, religion in China, because I thought that the foundation of all these Eastern religions is very important if we're going to talk about uh, the Western religions, Judaism and Christianity and Islam, this part. You can't really talk about it until you also have the background of the Eastern religions. Then I spent a few uh, sessions on Jud Judaism. After that, I moved to Plato, because I thought if I'm going to talk about Christianity at some point, Plato, I have to talk about Plato, because I think Plato has influenced Christianity greatly. So I, sp I spent two sessions on Plato, and I was itching to get back into Jewish-Israeli part in preparation to Christianity, but I thought, well, if I'm already in Greece, I might as well talk about the Greek religions. I originally didn't plan to talk about it because I thought it's a minor thing. I was surprised. It's not that minor. It, does, it is very relevant. And I spent three sessions uh, talking about the ancient Greek religions, uh, culminating last session on uh, Orphism, Dionysus, of which I will talk today, and uh, Eulysian Mysteries, another cult in Greece. And the next one is going to be about astrotheology, which is a inter very interesting intersection between the study of astronomy archaeology, and customs and religions. Because it turns out many of these gods originally were observation about uh, objects in the sky, like the sun, the moon. And many gods, they actually mimic the same objects. You can have three gods talking all about the sun, some aspects of the sun. So that's the background of my meetup group. I encourage you to check it out. This is the web page for the meetup. I have 100 members now. All right, now I'm going to get into uh, an element uh, related to the background, the history of traditions. But before we can even discuss it, we need to know the geography of the place. So we have a context about what, what we're talking about. And this area of Israel, there was no Israel then. There was the land of Canaan. But the land of Canaan is, this, is not all of this space. It's just a small sliver here. This whole area of today's Jordan, Lebanon, Syria, all of this was called the Levant. And this part is Mesopotamia. So I have a few maps. I'll just go through these maps so you have some context of the uh, times. Here's, this map shows a little bit more information. So you see how Egypt is arranged along the Nile River. There was no life far away from the Nile River. But the area of the Nile River was really fertile. They didn't even have much rain. They didn't uh, need the rain, and they didn't have it. All their vegetation was growing from the overflowing of the Nile River, because when the Nile River overflowed, all this land here became very fertile mud, and then it, things could grow in there. And a lot of their customs, the ancient Egypt's customs, they all surrounded surround, uh, this uh, uh, flow and cycles in this river. One of these gods I will talk about in a moment is Osiris, who represents several things. It, could, it also represents the sun, and it also represents the river. It represents the afterlife, because when uh, things die out in the winter, that's death. Osiris is underground in the afterlife. It gets spring, everything starts to grow again along the river. Osiris is alive. That's the general pattern in many customs. Here we see... Uh, now, this land of Canaan, the Israeli part, the Jewish part, I'm talking about. Of course, there was no Jews a while back then. But this is the area. And what is interesting here is to notice that this area is all green. It's all part of Egypt. And this is dated 1400 BC. Now, remember, the Exodus story is about 1200 BC. So if you're escaping Egypt, this is where you would be doing the escaping if this was the, still the map. And it was still the map. This land was under control of Egypt. So how could you be crossing the Red, River, the Red Sea here, trying to escape uh, the Egyptian army? If Egypt, this whole area was still Egypt. You haven't escaped Egypt. It was the Egyptian empire, right? 
you would have to cross somewhere there. And actually, there's a little bit, a little river here that you could cross by foot when it's shallow. So that's one of the theories is that if there was an exodus and if there was a myth of exodus, maybe that's what they meant. Maybe they meant that river, not this one. And this will be a general pattern of what I'm going to be talking about, that you will see that you can't take the stories in the Old Testament literally. Things just don't jump. They don't work uh, literally. You have to take it metaphorically as a myth. And the moment that you take it as a myth, uh, you start to take everything else as a myth around it. And you want to believe in God, fine, you can believe it, but you can believe in an abstract God, you can wonder about what happens after death, but you cannot take the actual religious stories literally. You take it metaphorically. And uh, not only atheists say so. R Rabbi Maimonides says, said this, the same. You will be a blockhead if you take it literally. So that's what I will be focusing about here. I want to take the absolute truth of it from the pedestal. It's not. It's not like that. Also here in the map we see Babylonia, which a lot of activity was going on here. Uh, and there was a lot of intermixing between the cultures, between here and here and Egypt and so on. Here we see uh, ancient Greece. A lot of activity was going on here. So you can imagine that they had a very active trade going on, and just like today, you can't keep information closed. With Twitter, it spreads out really quickly. Here, through trade, all the ideas and all the themes, memes, if you call it, would spread all around this area through trade. Egypt, for example, imported cedar from this area. So that means that there is a lot of exchange of ideas between these two areas. OK. Next map is just a printed modern map, so you compare this. So this is Israel. This is Megiddo. And in the previous map, Megiddo was here. So you see this goes all really far up north compared to the modern Israel. Here, final map I will show you today is um, this map is in a book by D.M. Murdoch, where I get a lot of my information for today. Uh, she puts uh, several things from different periods. You see how many cities are here along the Egypt. What is interesting, there's, there's a lot of activity here along the land of Canaan. These are, again, your Greek cities. And I just zoomed in on this part. That's what we're talking about. And I want you to see how many different nations and peoples live in that area, lived in that area. We have the Phoenicians. They live around here. The Philistines, they live around here. Canaanites, they're all of them were called in the Bible Canaanites. Also, you have the Amorites, which is uh, this? Okay. this whole area, this very large area, the Amorites. And actually, Amorites spread all the way to Babylon. There were Western Amorites and Eastern Amorites. And you see a lot of, there's a lot of small cities and locations. So to say that the Jews had something totally original, that they made up things out of vacuum, is just unrealistic. They interacted with the local people even on their own land nearby. And as you know, there were the southern uh, uh, country of, of Judaism, of Jews, they called the Judah centered around Jerusalem, and there was the northern part called Israel. This is in the Old Testament. I'm not, it's not questionable. There was Israel. And you see the Israel part, they were much closer to all these areas, Phoenicians and Biblos and Ugarit. So they inherited those customs much more prominently. They uh, did pray to Baal, the god Baal. And that was the whole problem between the two, because Jerusalem wanted to be the control. They wanted to be the capital. But you couldn't control people in antiquity if they don't pray to your God. God was an element that united people according to a certain kind of uh, ceremonies, traditions, and so on. So that's why there was a conflict between them. Uh, if you know Hezekiah, there was this king Hezekiah and uh, Josiah. He, he had a son, Manasseh, and then the next king was Josiah. And they were really going against uh, Israel, uh, saying, OK, you cannot do this. You cannot uh, do those pagan rituals. You have to believe in, in Jehovah and Jehovah. So this is the maps. 
Now, what archaeological findings do we have, substantial findings, that we can discuss this? I mean, the Old Testament is, is, a, is a work of literature, uh, how I see it. So uh, it's hard to go just by it. You need to have something tangible, something archaeological. And we actually do. We do have archaeological uh, findings. First, there is the Amarna letters. These are letters of communication between Egyptian uh, priests and uh, someone in the land of Canaan, administrator of Egypt. We have the Elephantine, and this the period, uh, I think it's around uh, 1200 BC. Uh, it's in the next slide. We also have the Elephantine papyruses, papyri, proper way to say it, papyri. Uh, these are found in a Jewish settlement in Egypt, in the south of Egypt, really, really far from where Israel is. Uh, uh, and they span a really large uh, span of time, but they finish at 600 uh, BC. What's surprising about them is that there's no mention of Moses, Exodus in those uh, writings, although they communicate with Jerusalem all the time. You can see that. Also, we have these cuneiform tablets. Does anyone know what's this cuneiform? They are in clay, so they get really well preserved. And how many tablets do you think we found all over this Israeli, Canaan land, and Babylon? 100,000? In one site, we found something on the tens of thousands. 10,000, 20,000, just one site. So we have a lot of them. But not all of these tablets talk about religion. Most of these tablets are business deals. You owe me this amount of money. Your mo money was cattle, grain, and so on. But in, there is still uh, information about religion among them. And we were able to decipher the language. The tablets that are found in the land of Canaan, they are written in a language called Ugarit. This was on the map here. That's the city Ugarit. And uh, turns out this language is really similar to Hebrew, even modern Hebrew. Even I could probably read it. I lived in Israel. I know Hebrew. And also, many names of the holy names, like uh, the word holy, Kadesh, and uh, the name of God, Elohim, all those special names, you would think, in Judaism, they actually same names in uh, Ugaritic. So they copied stuff. You can say, well, they copied and then they changed it. They just inherited the names. You can, you, but you can make these excuses for a while until they pile up and you, can, you cannot no longer make it. You have to say, well, maybe, maybe it's not so original, jumps. Okay, so these are some evidence that I have for you today. So let's just uh, a little bit more detail, among the letters, what you mentioned. This is the period that they span from it's the 14th century, 30 years of communication. And what interesting, uh, well, we know that Exodus by documentation should have happened later. So the fact that there's no mention of Exodus, maybe it's okay. Uh, but there is no mention of any kind of Jews enslaved in Egypt. There is mention, though, about uh, kind of vagabonds and robbers who were also workers by the name of Habiru or Apiru. Could you say that this kind of similar is like Hebrew? Apiru, Hebrew? Uh, that just similarity of sound here is not an evidence, uh, but uh, you can make a case that maybe these Habiru and Abiru were the ones who were the proto Israelis? Uh, here I have uh, some quote, but maybe it's too long to read. Uh, the highlight here is that a Hapiru leader of Habiru attacked the city of Megiddo. Megiddo is in Israel, so a little bit later. Actually, 14th century, so maybe not later. They were as widespread, these uh, Habiru. They're kind of like gypsies. They, they live in the style of, lived in the style of gypsies. <laughs> And uh, they awarded the supporters of his campaign, his attack campaign, the city of Shechem. Shechem is also in Israel. See, it was, it's on the map there. Uh, now, the thing is, in the Bible, Shechem became the center of the northern kingdom later, of Israel, much later, 400 years later, 600 years later. But uh, here is the one link that maybe these Conquerors of this uh, Shechem and Megiddo later turned into what became Israelis and Jews. 
So that's where they came from. And you can read more about this. Uh, this, this talk, by the way, is just opening a door for you, if this is new material. Uh, I encourage you to go and read these sources on your own. Uh, this is not esoteric stuff. These are academic writings, and you judge them on their merit. So you can read this guy, M.B. Roton, just about this point of Apiro name, how it's related to Hebrew name. Now, Elephantine Apiro is what I mentioned. It was found here at the south of Egypt. Uh, one of the highlights is that some, a letter called Passover letter. So it's religious in nature. There are letters religious in nature. There was a temple to Yahweh. And like I said, there's no mention of Torah, Moses, or Exodus. All right, so now I want to talk about something interesting. We say that Jews invented monotheism. Actually, that is not true, because many polytheistic uh, traditions, they had a top god. And they saw the other gods, the lower gods, uh, not even as children of that god. Not exactly, but more of attributes of this god. Like hands and legs and nose, aspects of this god, manifestations of this god. That's why they did have a lot of problem if uh, gods kind of overlap in their activity and their responsibility. If we go into ancient Greece, we have Demeter, who is goddess of vegetation. We have um, her daughter Persephone, who is a goddess of vegetation. And we have uh, Artemis, who is a goddess of vegetation. So which one it is? In monotheism, this wouldn't work. I'm the top god, and that's it. No one else can do what I do. I have a monopoly on everything. But they didn't have, the gods didn't have monopoly. Why is that? Because what I mentioned in the beginning of my, of my talk, that all these gods, they, they, they model celestial objects. They model the sun. The sun does different things in different times of the year. So you can have one god representing the sun in the winter, solstice, solstice, another god representing the sun in the summer solstice. You know, solstice is when the sun doesn't seem to move much in the sky. Here, I'm going to talk about this aspect of how the gods are manifestations of the creator god. In Egyptian, the word Ari is spelled like this. You'll all recognize the symbol. This is like the key symbol of all the Egyptian writings. They always show that I. Well, that I means, uh, uh, sounds like Ari or Ali. Think about Allah as a, as a side reference. But uh, here I'm going to focus on Ari. And it means to make, to do, to create, to form. And the idea is that the top creator, for example, Ptah, which is the Egyptian top creator, would create all these other gods that are most manifestations of him through this Ari. And Osiris that we say, Osiris, the god of the Nile, the, what I mentioned. That's very anglicized or converted name. It's actually, it's not like this in Egyptian. The, it is Oz Ari or Az Ari. It's a very different pronunciation that we converted to, uh, uh, to English. And we just say Osiris, but it's Azari. Same thing was going on with the Canaanites. You know, Elohim, which is how Jews today call their God, is actually a plural word, word because it ends on Im, right? Uh, the singular of this would be El. And El, lo and behold, that was the God of the Canaanites. That was the top God. And all his children, all his manifestations, uh, they are the other im. They are the other smaller Elohim. Altogether Elohim. One of which is, for example, Baal, who is, uh, you know, it's not a very big evil god just because it has horns. You know, Baal, the bull, it was a great animal that everyone loved because it's, it has a good sexual drive. And this was very important to people, everything to do with procreation. So that was a very positive image to everybody except the Jews, because the Jews didn't want a competition. Uh, so Baal was symbolized as this uh, bull or, or calf. But also there was a god Yam, who was the god of the sea. And the god of the sea was fighting this god of Baal. And the god of the sea was supposed to be the evil god. Why? Because, you know, if you have a flood, that's not good for anybody. No one is happy about it. But if you have rain, which Baal symbolizes in rain. Everyone is happy in Israel. You need rain for things to grow. Notice that Egypt had no god of rain. They didn't care about rain. They cared about the Nile. And also, interestingly, Yam is the name of uh, the sea of the, in Israel, in, in Hebrew today. So you see, all these names are the same. Also, the ending L is in many Hebrew names. 
even popular names today, not just biblical names. You know, Nathan, I had the co-worker in my company, Nathan L. Ends on L. What's wrong with Nathan? No, he wanted Nathan L. Uh, so here's some symbols. All these symbols, there's a way to, to write Azari, Osiris, Azari in Egyptian. There's as many symbols, as many aspects, manifestations of this God. Here we get a little bit closer to the meat of it, uh, talking about Old Testament. And you would think in the Old Testament there will be no mention of polytheism. It would be just, I am God, I am the only God. But you know, every time that there is this only God, one, he would say, I beat the other gods. You know, when you know, Moses, the follower of Moses, was conquering, uh, I forgot the name, he was conquering the land of Israel, it says, I'm God, I beat the Baal, I beat the Baal God. Well, if you beat the Baal God, you can see that there is another God, and you're stronger than the God. Only later, it became very abstract and, and high. But in the beginning, it was just saying, I'm just stronger than other gods. Notice that Allah, Allah said the same thing. All right, so here we, we see something in, uh, in the Old Testament. When God reveals himself to Abraham, he doesn't reveal himself as top God, which is in Hebrew, El Elyon. Elyon means top. He reveals himself as another manifestation, El Shaddai. Now, what is Shaddai? Shaddai actually means uh, breasts in, uh, in Hebrew. Shaddai means breasts. Not sure what it meant uh, in the context of the time. But the, the point is, is that here the Old Testament itself makes a uh, focus that he didn't reveal himself as the top god. He wanted uh, Abraham to think he, he's some other god. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and Jacob as El Shaddai, but by my name, Yahweh, I did not make myself known to them. And I read Hebrew, that's indeed what it says. Uh, okay. All right, now I'm going to talk about something else because I'm running out of time. I, I just hope I was able to show you that things are not so clear cut, it's so not black and white. And uh, there is a very interesting thing that was um, observed by many, many people, that there is similarity between Moses and Dionysius. Before I even talk about this, if you just go by the description of Exodus and Moses in the Old Testament, uh, you will see that the dates just don't make sense, the names of cities don't make sense. Cities that are mentioned in the Old Testament, dated to 1200 BC, weren't really called by that name or didn't exist. So if it happened, it must have happened much later, and written much later than it's claimed. It's claimed it was written by Moses, that all of Torah, all of the Old Testament was written by Moses. But uh, it doesn't make sense if you look at the dates, if you look at archaeology. If it has to be been written, it must have been written much later. But as I mentioned, the Elephantine papyr papyruses, which date to 600 BC, don't mention this either. So was it written even later? Was it written in 300 BC at the time of Alexander? That's one of the theories. Here I want to just talk about uh, similarity between Moses and the Greek god of wine, Dionysus. Think, oh, this is strange. Where does that come from? Well, no one hides that Dionysus and Osiris is the same thing. <coughs> Greeks themselves self admit that Dionysus traveled to them from Egypt. Now, wine and growing of grapes was a huge thing in Egypt. You have uh, Pharaoh Tutankhamun was found in his grave with 48 jars of wine. Many of the Egyptian priests had fields uh, of uh, grape growing. And there's not too much debate or controversy whether Dionysius and Osiris are really the same character, the same myth, representing wine and grapes. So when Osiris travels, just wine makes its way to other countries in nature and uh, communities. But what about Moses? Is Moses Dionysus? Here's one similarity. is uh, Mount Sinai, you know, where Moses gets his... Uh, Word from God. Well, there is, where did Dionysus grow up? Grew up on the mountain Nisa. Well, these are all English spelling of this, right? But uh, Nisa and, and Sina kind of spelled very similarly. You just flip the letters, letters around. So this similarity is an indication that, you know, when myths travel, 
It's like a broken telephone. It's not exactly, don't get exactly what you got, what you had. So Nisa and Sina, it's almost the same word spelled backwards, or something like that. It's called an anagram. All right, so that's one similarity. Both Moses and uh, Dionysus had a dog companion, except that Moses had a human being by the name of Caleb, which Caleb, Caleb, Kalba, that's all uh, words for dog in Hebrew. Uh, but you know, Dionysus had a dog companion, Moira, and that dog belonged to a daughter of a vine vineyard grower. So everything is wrong. For Dionysus, everything is about wine. Uh, there are other similarities. Uh, uh, one more thing. Osiris had a brother, Anubis, who is the god of the underworld, who is dis displayed as a jackal. Jackal is kind of like a dog, looks like a dog. So you see there is always a dog component. You think, dog, that's such a strange, why would you make it up a dog? Where does that come from? Well, here we get the link to these astronomical observations, that we have these uh, constellations they kind of look like a dog. So the Orion constellation had two companions, dogs. So that's your link. Why would you come up with this? Remember, these people didn't have much uh, entertainment. They could just look at the sky. <laughs> that's what they noticed. All right, so who noticed about this link? So many people, all, all of them are religious fanatics. Reverend, there's Catholic priest. A lot of them. But you know what they try to do? They try to claim that the Greeks copied the Jewish uh, culture, the Jewish traditions. Well, how can that be if Dionysius is much older? Dionysius goes back like a thousand years older. Uh, the culture of wine growing is actually 9,000 years old. There is evidence of wine making 9,000 years old. There is evidence of Dionysius uh, and Osiris faith and religion in Egypt and in ancient Greece, which is called the Mycenaean uh, culture, way before Judaism. It couldn't be that Greeks copied the Jewish traditions. It doesn't make sense. Copying must have been in the other direction, but these people couldn't even say it, even maybe if they wanted to. Uh, but probably they wanted to believe otherwise. So I'll just have many, many names. I will, just don't have time to list them all. Just to indicate to you how many names. All, and these are the dates, you see? Dates, fairly recent. Second screen of it. I have some comments. For example, Reverend Jonathan Edwards says, blind heathen Homer, and remember Homer wrote his poetry in 7th century uh, BC, has heard of Moses' biblical adventures and imitated them. Uh, Le Brun, French novelist, uh, says, the history of Moses copied from history of Bacchus. Bacchus is another name for Dionysus. Both born in Egypt. Both passed Red Sea on dry ground. They have, Dionysus has that in his tales, that he passed the Red Sea. Both lawgivers. Uh, why lawgivers? For example, the Orphic tradition of Dionysus called the head, like they introduced their own laws. Both picked in a box, floated on water. You know, even that tale is there. Uh, both struck the rock and made wine come out of it. Uh, Bacchus was worshipped in Egypt, Phoenicia, Syria, Arabia, Asia, and Greece before Abraham's day. More. It continues, just keeps going on. Uh, okay. So that's, that's basically I, uh, at the end of my... I just have five minutes. I'll mention one more point to conclude this. Uh, so here I, I showed you that maybe... The Old Testament is not a historical document. It's a mythical document, and you, but is it worth anything? Are there important moral lessons in this document? Isn't this what the religious people say? Well, we need religion for morality. Otherwise, how do we know right from wrong? Even if it's false, it's better than nothing. Without God, everyone will become, will become a serial killer. <laughs> and you know the reason that you call yourself humanists and not just atheists, is because you want to have something positive, saying, I'm not just against, I have something that added value, that I come in with added value, and you have uh, some philosophy that you add on top of your atheism. Uh, by the way, I'm not a humanist. I have a different philosophy, and you can ask me about it in question period. Uh, so here I want to talk about the ethics of the Old Testament. I'll just mention one point. 
because I am running out of time. Uh, most people think, well, even if it's false, the lessons are good. We just take the lessons, throw away the rest. I don't think the, the lessons are good. What, what is the lesson? What's the major lesson? Well, in the book of Samuel, you have this uh, thing called Song of Hannah, which I think is similar to the whole theme of the Old Testament. Well, what does it say? Uh, to, I'll just start in the middle. Talk no more so very proudly. Let no arrogance come from your mouth, for the Lord is the God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and those who stumbled are girded with strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out of bread, and the hungry have ceased to hunger. Even a barren has borne seven, and she who has many children has become feeble. Uh, the Lord kills and makes alive. He brings down to the grave and brings up. The Lord makes poor and makes rich. He brings low and lifts up. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the beggar from the ash heap to set them among princes. For by, the last paragraph. For by strength no man shall prevail. prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in pieces. From heaven he will thunder against them. What is the point here? How I read this? You may have a disagreement. I see here you cannot be proud. You cannot be confident. doesn't matter how well you are. God is bigger than you and he puts you down. You have to be humble before God. And then maybe he'll be nice to you. And where do we see other examples of this in the Old Testament? Well, we have the book of Job, right? Where he was doing so well. He wasn't even Jewish. It was, in, it was in Mesopotamia. He was like in Babylonian area, way before Abraham. He was doing really well, and suddenly he gets penalized for no reason. So I think what, what the Old Testament is really challenging and raising into question is uh, what it means to have free will. What it means to have self-determination. What it means to have an identity. When Eve took that apple, these humans in the Garden of Eden, uh, Eden no, no animal can think outside the box. If you have like a cow, will always eat the grass. But here, a human was predetermined to do certain things, and he went outside of that box. I want to try something I wasn't programmed to, to do it. I'm going to have that apple. Well, you want to do what you want? You want to have self-determination? Okay, let's see how you can manage. You have to leave the nice place of Garden Eden and try to make your way, try to survive. Like the child who leaves his house. I don't want to live with you. I, I want to get my own apartment. I want to live with a roommate. Well, see how we can do. Get a job. Try. So I think what the Old Testament really does is it's, it's taking this difficult subject, an interesting subject of free will and self-determination. But what is the main point? What's the conclusion? Well, you think you kind of have free will, but you don't. I know everything. And if you think you become too proud, I'm going to put you down. Uh, so I don't think it's a very good lesson. I'll finish my last slide. Here I'm going to read you. I, I'm uh, philosophically an objectivism. I, objectivist. I uh, read the writings of Ayn Rand. Here I'm going to read you uh, this quote about free will by Ayn Rand. Man's consciousness shares with animals the first two stages of its development. Sensations, it's like touching, and perceptions, making sense of, if you hear a melody, it comes, you understand as a melody, not just separate notes. That's perception. But it is the third state, conceptions, understanding what things are, recognizing that this is a chair, and this chair, and they're similar. These are conceptions. That makes him man. Sensations are integrated into perceptions automatically. We automatically hear a melody, a musical melody, uh, by the brain of a man of, or of an animal. But to integrate perceptions into conceptions by a process of, uh, of abstractions is a feat that man alone has the power to perform. And he has to perform it by choice. You have to have the free will. You cannot just sit back and automatically make these uh, connections. My son is just three. He keeps asking me these questions. What is good? What is bad? He's trying to connect things. The process of abstraction and concept formation is a process of reason, of thought. It is not automatic or instinctive, nor involuntary, nor infallible. Man has to initiate it, to sustain it, and to hear responsibility for its results. Preconceptual level of consciousness is non-volitional. Uh, non-volitional, so you don't have to... Uh, you, you, are, you are conscious, you can't help it, so you're, you're conscious. 
Volition begins with the first syllogism. Syllogism is logic. First idea, if it's raining, must be clouds in the sky. Man has choice to think or evade, to maintain a state of full awareness or to drift from moment to moment. In a semi-conscious days, at the mercy of whatever association whims, then focused mechanism of his consciousness produces. So the idea is that you shouldn't just drift like this. Decide where you're going. I think that would be a proper moral lesson uh, which would oppose the lesson in the Old Testament. That's it. Thank you. Thank you.